Welcome to Green Party Live. I'm Molly Scott Cato. I used to be an MEP until Brexit happened and I'm now the Finance and Economy Speaker for the Green Party of England and Wales. We've seen over these past 11 months, extraordinary 11 months that none of us anticipated, how a crisis like this can really bring out the best in people and sometimes the worst in people as well. And we've really seen some of the worst aspects of our society exposed, especially in terms of inequality. We've seen some challenges, I think, to our commitment to being a caring and sharing society, but we've also seen people show the most extraordinary commitment and compassion. But what happens when our compassion is tested and stretched a little bit further? What happens when we know that the vaccine represents a real source of hope for us personally? How far are we then prepared to share that hope with others? This is a real moral dilemma and I'm glad you're with us tonight to discuss it because I don't think it's easy for any of us. Tonight we'll be discussing access to the COVID-19 vaccine for everybody, everybody on planet Earth, everybody that's part of our human community. And we're gonna be talking about how we can implement laws and policies that encourage vaccine solidarity, not vaccine nationalism. We often hear politicians say nobody is safe until everybody is safe, but we're gonna really explore what that means in practical terms. If that's what we believe, why did we see the ugly scenes of conflict over vaccine supplies in Europe a couple of weekends ago? And why are levels of vaccination so shockingly low in countries in the majority world? As Greens, we value conversation, dialogue and debate. And much of this dialogue and debate is difficult. If it wasn't, we wouldn't need politics if we all automatically agreed with each other. But we know that the problems and the solutions to those problems will not be sorted out unless we work through the debate properly because we're not gonna get anywhere just with empty rhetoric and sound bites. So I'm glad you're here with us. We're gonna think through some of those issues together. I don't suppose we'll get all the answers, but we've got three excellent panelists here, one of whom is an MEP who's got real influence on policy in, in the EU. One is a doughty campaigner for fair access to medicines for everybody. And the third speaker has expertise in supporting healthcare access across the world for those for whom access is more difficult. So in a minute, I'm gonna ask them to introduce ourselves, but before that, just a little bit of housekeeping. We're gonna have just under 30 minutes, the second half of the hour basically will be to answer your questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A box and you can also vote to support the questions you would like to have answered. So the most popular ones come to the top of the box and I see those ones and put them to the panelists. And we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. So let's find out who we've got with us on our panel this evening. I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves, starting with Izzy and then Rose and then Kim, please. Hi everyone, so my name is Izzy Jani Friend and I'm based in the UK. I have cystic fibrosis and I'm a health writer and patient leader for Just Treatment, which is a campaigning organisation which seeks to put patients before politics and profits. And we help um, gain access to essential medications and fight for our healthcare systems. So it's been 11 months now since I went into isolation to shield from COVID-19 as my cystic fibrosis places a very real threat onto my lungs. Um, I'm clinically extremely vulnerable because cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder that causes mucus to get blocked in my lungs and digestive system. So obviously um, the nature of COVID is very big risk to my already damaged lungs. Um, as a patient leader for just treatment, we help campaigning around issues at the moment we're doing, um, working towards um, the COVID vaccine. Um, and we're patient led, so patient stories are at the forefront of what we do because they're affected directly by decisions that are made in healthcare systems. Um, we fought to tackle injustice, injustices where big farmers monopoly profits have put NHS patients lives at risk um, in regards to a central cystic fibrosis drug so called Orkambi. Um, and now we're fighting for a new deal for the NHS um, and to bring an end to all monopolies on COVID so private profit can't undermine the global pan pandemic response. Brilliant, thanks a lot Izzy. 
Hi everyone, um, I'm Roz, uh, Roz Scors. Um, I'm policy advisor for the Medicines Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders Access to Medicines campaign. Um, so MSF is an international humanitarian organisation uh, who work with crisis affected populations. And the access campaign specifically within MSF is a campaign that focuses on increasing access to life saving medical products, including vaccines, treatments and diagnostics for MSF operations, the places that we work, but also beyond. Um, my work specifically focuses, I'm based in the UK, so I focus on these policies from a kind of UK lens um, and ensuring equitable access to life saving products, uh, particularly for low and middle income countries. And obviously right now, uh, particularly in relation to COVID medical products. Thanks a lot, welcome. Is it up to me now? Yes. Yes. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, my name is Kim van Sparatak. I'm a Dutch member of the European Parliament for the Greens EFA, and I, I do miss uh, Molly as my colleague, to be honest. Um, so it's very nice to be here with you all tonight. Um, yes, yeah, so in the Parliament, um, I have been working a lot on, um, you know, how do we make sure that um, uh, Medicines are affordable and accessible for all. Uh, next year, there will be a big review of uh, the way we treat, the way we deal with uh, big pharmaceutical companies. And I have, um, together with my colleagues, written a strategy on how to tackle that. How do we make sure that you know all the money, the public money that we put into um, uh, big, big pharmaceutical uh, research actually uh, is also in the benefit of the people? Um, so this is uh, what I'm focusing on, and it's also the focus that I have in general. How do we make sure that Europe is not being led by big corporations, but led by people with a heart for people and um, with, um, with uh, solidarity in mind? Um, so um, very much looking forward to the debate tonight. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you all, and, and thanks for being with us this evening. So the first question is kind of an introductory one, and uh, I thought we'd start by exploring why politicians say nobody is safe until everybody is safe. It's a really nice slogan and it makes them sound like really good people, but I wonder how much they really mean that in practice. And I'm going to start off with our politicians, so I'm going to throw that one to you first, Kim. Yeah, thank you so much. So actually, I think it was the director of the WHO who said it first, and now it has become like, uh, you know, a sentence used worldwide for solidarity. And um, so the thing is, um, as we are seeing, as long as um, people are having the virus, uh, the virus is still uh, contagious um, and it will still be spread. So if, if uh, there are still people who can actually transmit uh, the COVID uh, virus, we know that, that people still can get sick. Um, we also see that, that you know, the mutations are, are growing um, and that, that we have more and more mutations coming up and they're becoming stronger. And um, per perhaps we might soon, not, uh, soon find out that we will have a mutation uh, of the virus that uh, will be immune for the vaccine, uh, which will, you know, we will have to start from the beginning um, all over again. Um, so I think when we're talking about nobody's safe until everybody's safe is because that is true. And um, we have to make sure that the people who can get the most sick will um, get the vaccines first, because um, the more sick you are, um, the, the, the more you trans can transmit the virus. Um, and that's why it, it only makes sense to not only look at the people in your own community, but since this is a global pandemic, to look at everyone in the world and make sure that the virus is transmitted as little as possible. And that is by starting to uh, vac vaccinate the, the, first, uh, the most vulnerable people first. Okay, thank you very much. Izzy, would you like to um, reflect on why politicians say that and what they mean by it? Yeah, I mean, I think that it is obviously important that like we have to have, you know, everyone, nobody is safe until everybody's safe. I mean, I have family that are living in India that haven't left their flats in 11 months. And I don't want to get access to this vaccine before they do, but I know that I will. And it's not fair. Our lives in the West aren't more valuable than the rest of the world. And even 
like it, people in like richer countries that are getting the vaccine like our safety will depend on the safety of everybody like him said like we all need we're all going to need the vaccine or mutations like we don't know how many mutations there'll be or anything and it's so unknown but also it's just like ethical like everybody should have access to the vaccine because all lives are important and so although yeah politicians say that I think that it is actually true that we won't be safe till everybody's safe and we should be caring about everybody and not just our own lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah thank you and uh, perhaps we'll go now to Ros who obviously through Médecins Sans Frontières really sees how well that uh, statement's being fulfilled across the world. Yeah, no, absolutely, or or not as it were at the moment. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I just uh, just before this actually, I just quickly checked the vaccine tracker globally, and it's, it seems now there's been 134 million doses administered around the world, and still only 55 of those in anywhere in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're mm. seeing really, really stark inequity in who is getting access, particularly to COVID vaccines right now. But obviously, this is true for other medical products. Um, it was for PPE, personal protective equipment, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, some treatments are now very, very starkly for, for COVID vaccines. I think more than ever, I think this pandemic has shown us how, how interconnected we are as a, as a world. You know, we, it's no use one country tackling this alone. We have to have global solidarity. We have to have global collaboration if, we, if we're going to get on top of this pandemic. You know, as, as Kim mentioned, we're seeing these variations now, some of which, um, you know, vaccines are less effective against those. Um, and so, you know, even if, for example, the UK vaccinated its entire population, um, you know, if, if the pandemic is still raging elsewhere, we could see the rise of variants and that would put us again back at risk. So it's really important to ensure equitable access for, you know, moral, but also epidemiological and economic reasons. There, there are so many reasons why this is important and that this statement is really true in, in many ways. Yeah, I think when you think about it as a statement and coming back to what Izzy said, it's just really obvious that all human lives are of equal value and it doesn't make any difference whether a person with a certain level of medical vulnerability is here or in Canada or in Mali. Morally, you can't see a difference. But I have to say to you that when I tried to develop this line, because I'm um, in charge of external, I'm the coordinator for external comms for the Green Party. And when I tried to write down a line, which I thought was the right ethical line, I could just imagine how unpopular that was going to be with most people, you know, saying, actually, you're going to have to wait because somebody in Mali hasn't been vaccinated yet. Um, so even though we can all see morally this is right, I think, you know, by the end of our discussion, we need to really think about how to make that case better to citizens, because for a lot of us, it's the first time we've really been afraid for our lives, you know, because we just haven't faced that. And that's been a really frightening experience and the result of that fear is people have become much more selfish has been my observation in some ways uh, you know so yeah it's interesting it's it's easy to be glib as a politician and say that but following through and actually saying you've got to wait for somebody in Mali or you know wherever is, is quite challenging I think anyway let's reflect on something which I think is positive now I'm going to ask Ros whether I'm right about that which is the the COVAX program what's actually happening with COVAX is it a real thing is anybody actually getting vaccinated as a result of it can you explain what it is to people here tonight yeah um yeah no of course so um basically the COVAX facility is a, a kind of pool procurement facility for COVID vaccinations. So back at the, early on in the pandemic, the World Health Organization came together with Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, and an organization called CEPI, who uh, work on pandemic preparedness, particularly in relation to the development of vaccines. And they set up this uh, facility called the COVAX facility. And the overall aim of the COVAX facility is to increase equitable uh, distribution of COVID vaccines, essentially. So um, it, it basically is, is a way of trying to coordinate globally the procurement of COVID vaccines and to ensure that uh, they're distributed equitably around the world. So there is a there's kind of two elements to the, the, the COVAX facility. There's a, there's a bucket uh, where, or for self-financing countries or rich countries essentially, where they can come together um, and basically buy vaccines for their populations through the COVAX facility. Um, but there's also a second um, bucket of work within the COVAX facility 
which is for 92 low and middle income countries. And this um, piece of work is where basically richer countries can essentially donate money so that um, these um, 92 countries are able to procure COVID vaccinations. And then the idea was then that based on the World Health Organization allocation framework, um, which basically is a mechanism or, or kind of framework which um, states, you know, priority populations for vaccination around the world. So a bit like we have that framework in the UK in terms of the tier system of, of who, who is priority. This is that allocation framework, but for the world. Um, the idea was then that within that COVAX facility, um, the COVID vaccinations would be distributed um, in line with the WHO allocation framework and basically according to, to need um, and not based on who can pay the most. Because, you know, just to also say that the COVAX facility was set up essentially because of a failing status quo that we have. We, you know, it was foreseen that what would happen in the absence of COVAX and even now with COVAX, we are seeing that actually what is really happening is that the control of who gets access to these these products is in the hands of pharmaceutical companies and they do sell these to, to governments and people that pay the most. And so this was kind of foreseen um, and the COVAX facility was set up to try and prevent that, but obviously is seeing some of the same challenges and is, is actually at this point struggling to prevent that happening with companies and governments um, procuring and distributing vaccines completely outside of the COVAX facility. Yeah, so it ha essentially has ended up in a market where those with the strongest financial power are getting supplies. Yeah. Even though, so can I just check with COVAX because it's it feels a little bit to me like climate action. You know, people promise something that's like not going to impact on them at all today. Like in ten years' time, we'll do this. It's a little bit like that with COVAX. It seems to me people are offering money, but money isn't what people need now, is it? It's vaccine supplies that they need. So are people actually offering? to share their vaccine supplies. Like the UK has, I don't know, 100 million doses on order, lots of doses available now. Are we or any other country actually at present sending those to other countries that need them? I think that's a really good question. I think it's been one of the most frustrating things about, about kind of the UK's position on this actually, is that you know the UK has given an enormous amount of money over 500 million pounds to the COVAX facility and um, you know obviously funds are always welcome and, and that will support the COVAX in that sense but actually the really critical challenge that we're seeing um, COVAX facing now is not enough supplies so there's not enough doses for them to actually buy because we're in a situation of artificial supply constraints due to pharmaceutical monopolies and so we're now in a situation where COVAX has not actually got enough available doses for it to buy to serve the countries that it's supposed to serve at the same time rich countries like the UK for example are buying up multiple times the amount of vaccines that they will need for that to vaccinate their their own population so the UK now has more than four times enough vaccinations for to vaccinate its entire population, uh, you know, entire adult population, not just priority groups. And so when you have a situation where rich countries um, are, are doing that in a situation of finite global supply due to monopolies, that basically leaves low and middle income countries through the COVAX facility with, to go without. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Thanks very much. That was really helpful. So let's move on to Kim now. And perhaps you can explain a little bit about what went wrong when we ended up with a big battle over vaccine supplies in the EU, because it was pretty ugly scenes. And we actually put out a joint statement saying all the right kinds of things. But I don't suppose we had much impact with that, did we? I feel it's still a pretty competitive process. Can you let us know what's happening? Yes. Um, so there's a lot of things going on, uh, but I think and tomorrow we'll have another debate about it in the European Parliament. But I, I guess what the, the main thing that happened was we have contracts. The European Union has contracts with um, the pharmaceutical companies, as does the UK. And um, these pharmaceutical companies have promised several things to the UK, several things to the European Union. Um, and and um, suddenly AstraZeneca told um, uh, to the European Commission, uh, I'm sorry, we're not going to, uh, we're sorry, we, I'm not going to deliver um, the amount of, uh, of vaccines as we promised. And um, the thing is, of course, that, you know, based on, on the promises and the agreements that are made in the contracts, um, all the national uh, vaccination strategies have been planned. Um, so 
all the vaccination strategies of all the different member states uh, were in jeopardy because of this uh, problem. Mm. Um, what it shows to me is that these pharmaceutical companies are apparently so powerful and we are so vulnerable towards them that they can actually do this. Um, and what uh, AstraZeneca managed to do is uh, create a conflict rather than, um, than between the commission and AstraZeneca, which it uh, effectively was because they weren't, you know, um, coming uh, forward with the, with the, the uh, promised doses. Um, it became a conflict between the, the EU and the UK because apparently um, uh, the, there were some provisions in the contract with the UK that said, okay, uh, we, we, have, um, we can get uh, the first vaccines that come out of the, of the production facilities um, when they are produced in the UK and also perhaps also the ones in Europe. Um, nothing about that is completely clear because the contracts are, um, are not transparent, they're not open. Um, after this whole fight, um, the contracts became uh, the contract became public, but still a lot of it um, has been blacked out. Although because of a tiny mistake, we've also seen more than we should have because someone um, put down put the wrong uh, PDF online. Um, but still, that always happens. The way... <laughs> still, it's not the way that we want to want to get our information. We need transparency to know exactly what the promises are. Um, and, um, and uh, this is something that we, we have been fighting for since the beginning. Um, we also probably know the prices that are, are being paid for the doses because of a mistake, but not because it was published officially. But I think the main thing this shows is that, um, you know, we, we, we just don't have a chance because these, these pharmaceutical companies are too big um, and they have managed to um, negotiate um, with with uh, member states, with the Commission, with the UK, uh, on the basis of you need us, so just give us lots of money to produce um, these vaccines, uh, and and we'll just see whether uh, we will actually deliver on them. And um, I think that's uh, a very painful situation to be in during a global mm. pandemic. I mean, it was already very problematic before, but now we we really see, you know, we are so dependent on big corporations whose main aim is to create profit for shareholders rather than ending a global pandemic, um, that we really have to reconsider how we deal with pharma and also you know, how, we, how we value public health and whether we want that to be in the hands of big corporations or not. Yeah, let me just check one thing out with you before I move on to Izzy. And, you know, as an economist, obviously the most fundamental iron law of economics, and one I do think is true, is that when there's a scarce resource, the price rises. And obviously that's not the way that this should be working. We shouldn't be having such a vital drug of, you know, subject to market forces like that. But do you think it is the case that the reason Britain got supplies of AstraZeneca vaccine rather than the EU was that we paid a higher price for them? Uh, I, I can totally uh, imagine that is actually the case. Mm. I mean, but we don't uh, know because the contracts are hidden and the prices exactly. are hidden, yeah, even though it's our money. Know. We don't know, yeah. but we do see, you know, also the way that other pharmaceutical companies, for example, Pfizer last week, um, announced uh, so happily that they are going to uh, make uh, more than 3 billion euro profit this year because of the COVID vaccine. I mean, that's that's what they are going for right now. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. I try to stay calm and in the moral universe, but I can feel myself getting a bit hot under the collar now. But let's move over to, to Izzy and maybe you could reflect a little bit on what we've been talking about here in terms of, you know, the competition over, over these drugs and from your experience of the need for everybody to have fair access to the drugs they need. Yeah, definitely. I think obviously Kim and Ros touched on like most of it, but um, I would say that obviously, yeah, like they said, like research and development was largely public, publicly funded and it had huge amounts of like government coordination. And what we're seeing now is the control of profit driven pharma companies and there's no transparency or control. And that's the consequence of handing over what should be public goods to the private sector. And I think that it's happened before as well, like with access to essential medications where there's been, you know, struggles between what pharma want to pay and what, you know, health um, organizations can afford. And I think that it's like not right when there's medications that could save somebody's life and we're not giving it to them 
based on profit it's not how I don't know how we can like be okay with that and really accept no. that because I think you know our lives are more important than profit and politics like they have to be but it's just not the case it feels like it's not the case in like the government and yeah so what what the pharma companies would say in response to that is if we didn't make a profit we wouldn't get involved in the um research and development but my answer to that is we pay for the research and development so why do you get the profits right am i am i right yeah and the amount that goes in the amount that they're earning on the vaccines is like so so much compared to how much it costs anyway so they're making huge profits Mm -hmm. we'll 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 move on in a bit to think about patents and whether that's part of the problem here but before we get to that question um i when i was trying to develop a line for this i got interested in what was happening in other countries because we wanted to propose in fact we started a petition saying frontline workers should get vaccinated and that should be balanced against uh, medical needs so once the oldest people and those in clinical priority had been vaccinated in other words once it got to my sort of age group of 57 we need to think about people that are actually driving buses and risking infection more as well as clinical um, priority or clinical risk. And um, I noticed that other countries are prioritizing people really differently in terms of who gets the vaccine. And it, it was interesting to me that, that, you know, that might be something about the, the national cultures there. So in India, for example, the first person to get the vaccine was a sweeper, which is like kind of a very socially low class, isn't it? So do you want to start reflecting on that, Izzy? Have you, have you watched that? And uh, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think it is. I've not seen like the reasons for how they've made the decisions. Like initially, so I'm clinically extremely vulnerable, but initially I was put like way down the bottom of the list and I don't even know the reasoning behind that. And then recently I've been moved up to fourth. So I am getting my vaccine this week, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't really make sense. I'm not really sure how they decide it. I don't know if there's, there's definitely not been like coordination about the decisions that have been made. And I feel like it's very, like randomly allocated and people aren't really I think it's just all very chaotic I'm not really sure I think it's obviously bad though I think the people that are most at need should be getting them as like as soon as possible is don't really know what the delay is um mm -hmm. no I'm really surprised you haven't been vaccinated yet I, I assumed you would have been yeah I mean I thought I'd be like initially I thought I'd get it like the at first because everyone that's been shielding has obviously been like in their homes for almost yeah. a year um but I am having it this week, so it's okay. So only three more weeks of shielding and then you'll be able to emerge a little bit, maybe. I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope for you as well. Um, anybody else got any thoughts about that? Have you, Ros, been watching what's happening in different countries and how they're prioritising, you know, between their own citizens with the supplies they've got? Yeah, not so closely in individual countries. Obviously, our position really on this is that, you know, globally, um, frontline healthcare workers um, and the most vulnerable need to have access as a priority. Um, and so, yeah, basically, wherever you live, um, if you're a frontline healthcare worker or, or in the you know, priority vulnerable groups, you should have access as a priority, um, you know, according to the kind of global allocation framework. But, you know, so overall this needs to be based on needs and not who who is paying the most essentially and i think going back to your earlier point molly i think the critical thing is that you know really we shouldn't we shouldn't be in a situation of scarce supplies we shouldn't be in a situation where it's between one priority group getting access versus the other or someone in the UK getting access versus someone in Mali, like you said, you know, we, we don't want, why are we in a situation of artificial supply limitations? Why is there not enough to go around? Why having had billions of pounds of public funding go into these products, have we handed over the, the control and rights and ownership of these products to pharmaceutical companies? Because what that does is it limits supplies because intellectual property or, or kind of ownership of these products means that basically no, no other manufacturers around the world are able to start scaling up production of these and as you say molly it also keeps prices high right because you have mm. you know exclusivity of the market and so what we're seeing is is artificial supply because of pharmaceutical monopolies um, that they hold on these products despite the public investment and so we've got now a situation where we're now reliant on one or two companies as the eu discovered very harshly they were relying on AstraZeneca for their for their product when they didn't get it when actually if we'd gone for more of an open source approach where 
essentially intellectual property, the knowledge, the data, the know-how of how to produce these products, which by the way is the model that Oxford University actually wanted to go down um, for this, uh, for their vaccine, but in the end they signed an exclusive license with AstraZeneca. If we had gone for the open source approach, then we may have more manufacturers starting to come online and would see that over the coming year. And so I think we need to look at why are we fighting over supplies when this is art an artificial situation that we can overcome just by deciding that we shouldn't hand over rights to these products to pharmaceutical companies when they actually haven't invested in development of them in the first place. Yeah, maybe we'll ask Kim to take up that issue as well, because I know that um, the Greens in the European Parliament are, are calling for the TRIPS waiver. Perhaps you could explain to us um, what that means and how the whole TRIPS system works and how intellectual property is controlled and whether the EU does have the sort of negotiating power to prevent the pharmaceutical companies operating these monopolies and creating scarcity. Yeah, so um, perhaps first of all to go into to, to, to the TRIPS waivers. So uh, we already discussed very, uh, 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 very shortly, you know, this whole question of patents and um, also who, who, who owns the intellectual property. Um, and um, the WHO has, and the World Trade Organization have uh, sort of a minimum standard of protection of IP rights. Um, and um, we, we, uh, this is called the TRIPS. And um, it basically means that um, it is possible for, uh, for countries to put in a compulsory license and um, and uh, take away um, the you know the monopoly of these big pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, on the knowledge on uh, on medication um, back in the hands of the people, and um, this is basically um, what we are calling for now. In in general, usually um, it's really a country by country thing to do, um, and uh, now. We are actually calling for a TRIPS waiver for all the patents and all the intellectual property and all the knowledge that there is uh, to make sure we get, um, you know, a complete pool of, of information um, and as much information as possible to ramp up the production of the vaccines, because this is actually the main problem. We, we, we are not producing enough vaccines. And this is because these, you know, big corporations that are sitting on their knowledge and refuse to share it um, with anyone else so that they can produce it and keep the prices high. Um, and um, this is something that you can actually tackle by having the TRIPS waiver. And, um, and it's also something that is very interestingly um, being supported by almost every country except for the rich countries. So it's, it's really, you know, it's almost so every country that doesn't have a pharmaceutical corporation based in them, right? Exactly. Hey. Exactly. Yes. So it's just so clear who they are protecting. They're not protecting, you know, public health. They are protecting the pharmaceutical companies. And it's really, really frustrating. And especially when you think about, you know, in the beginning, you know, when the pandemic started, everyone was saying and like, yes, of course, you know, we, we will put all the knowledge together because this is something we have to fight together. And I think that that was gone in a week. You know, after a week, they were already like, oh, no, 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 uh, we, we, it will be much better if we do it all by ourselves and we keep the knowledge. Um, and, and I think the most frustrating thing is that, you know, you see that um, now the, the big corporations are replying to this, to this call for sharing the knowledge with, well, um, but you, do, you don't know, uh, we, we are not going to explain exactly how you have to produce it. Um, there's not enough production facilities. Um, that actually have the know-how how to produce them. But actually, if we would have started sharing the information from the beginning, by now we would have been able to produce vaccines almost everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So um, they're also delaying um, the, the production uh, of, of more vaccines. Um, and th this is only creating um, you know, a, a, a better, a, a more profitable market for them, but it's not benefiting anyone. Okay, um, Izzy, would you like to tell us what Just Treatment think about this whole issue of um, open patents and stopping drug companies having monopolies on knowledge? Well, we agree that obviously health should be a common good. 
um, and we think that there should be more transparency with the deals that have been made and that Big Pharma should be pressured into joining like COVAX or TRIPS because they're both like they both could work if enough if they joined and obviously shared their like know-how and their research and development um, and I guess it needs to also recognize the public money that went into it um, and we are just asking we're just asking to put pressure on Big Pharma because we need a collaborative global response and this profit driv driven ap approach is definitely costing lives and we need a, an affordable and accessible COVID vaccine for everybody everyone needs that needs it and I don't really think that Big Pharma should be allowed to hold the monopoly and decide who gets access and at what price so yeah to work together against that yeah I must say I think this issue about how big pharma is actually limiting supply because obviously again going back to sort of standard market economics if you want the price to go up you limit supply and so it's easy to believe that that's what they're doing and certainly they wouldn't want completely free supply because then the, the price would be very low and they wouldn't profit i don't think that argument's got out there very much in the public debate actually it's much more about i want you can't have, you know it's much more on that level so i see somebody in the questions and answers asked is this something we can lobby on and it raises for me the question of whether there's a, a global petition to have a trips waiver on COVID vaccines. Has anybody seen a petition like that? Or if not, let's start one after the meeting. Anybody know? Um, so there, there are petitions in um, specific countries to ask their countries to support um, the waiver. Uh -huh. um, so I know that a number of organizations in the UK, for example, um, have, you know, um, Kind of write to your MP to support the, the to ask the government to support the IP waiver, for example, particularly in the UK, obviously, because they're one of the big opposing countries. Um, so global justice now and potentially just treatment, I'm not sure, um, potentially might have um, one, although Izzy can correct me. Um, also, MSF, we're going to be launching a supporter action also. And obviously, as you'll know, Caroline Lucas has actually tabled an early day motion on, on this topic in the UK. And so similar kinds of actions are happening, um, I think, in other countries, particularly in the countries that are opposing um, the waiver. So um, in EU countries, uh, the US, um, so for sure in the UK, there are definitely um, campaigns and petitions asking uh, people to support this, which we can obviously circulate. Yeah, um, maybe I think afterwards we get to action points. So maybe um, Holly and Julie can make sure that those contacts get circulated and we, we make more of them through our comms. I think we have a, um, a petition about um, pressuring the government to publish the deal with AstraZeneca mm -hmm. and we're writing to the government to um, make sure like to stop big big pharma monopolies essentially so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, but i can't help thinking that if people grasp this issue you know there's like seven and a half billion people on the planet surely we could get quite a few million to sign up and say let's do this if we could get the right vehicle anyway i'm gonna move over to see what people who are here wanted us to ask ah oh, here's some interesting ones okay so top of the pile is why is the UK buying much more than we need? Anybody want to have a go at that one? Um, okay, so I can jump, <laughs> uh, <laughs> jump in. Uh, um, I think to be to be blunt, I do think that you know the UK's COVID strategy has been vaccination. You know, the, in terms of, I feel like. There's been a few, you know, there's been some challenges along the way. Let's say the UK has had one of the highest death rates um, in the world uh, per population. So um, yeah, there's been there's been many failures that we've seen. And I think they've basically relied on their vaccination strategy as the way out of the pandemic, which obviously is very problematic in many ways. Um, but what that meant was that they invested very early um, and at risk. Um, you know, obviously. Um, to to purchase um, these different uh, COVID 
vaccine candidates before many of them or most of them had been proven safe and effective at that point. So they, they agreed advanced purchase commitments with pharmaceutical companies di di directly, so bilaterally with them, not going through the COVAX facility um, to pre-book um, hundreds of doses, hundreds of millions of doses of COVID vaccines. And obviously they, they went for a, um, you know, broad um, variety of different COVID vaccines, um, because at that point they weren't sure uh, which would be effective and which different technologies might be most effective. And obviously now we're starting to see the, um, the, the data on the efficacy of the different vaccine candidates. Um, and so I think the UK w went for that strategy and, and, and that at risk public funding, um, you know, that they, that they put into the development of these vaccines um, has now resulted in them starting to get access to, to some of the candidates. But obviously, you know, the, the impact of that is that, you know, the UK is able to do that because they're a rich country. So they're able to make those deals um, and now have over 400 million doses um, available or pre-booked. Um, and so obviously many, many countries, most of the low middle income countries around the world are absolutely not able to do that. Um, and they're, so, they're solely relying on the COVAX facility to, for access for these products. And so this is where we see the supply challenges coming in, the monopolies coming in. And it's a really, really, really challenging situation where you have rich countries like the UK who have access to enough COVID vaccines, then also blocking things like the IP waiver which would allow manufacturers in lower middle income countries to start producing some of these products, not just vaccines, but other products too, like treatments, personal protective, protective equipment, um, diagnostics, to have rich countries blocking other countries' opportunities to start producing whilst they sit on their own supply is really um, an unforgivable position, I think. Anybody else want to jump in there or do you think she's covered that? Do you think Ros has covered that sufficiently? I'll hop over to another question then. Here's an interesting question. So a couple of people are asking, why doesn't the WHO have more power to um, stop governments being very selfish? Well, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that, <laughs> that's essentially what they ask. Um, does your Kim want to come in on that one? Well, I, I, could, I could try um, because um, I guess the, the mandate of the WHO is given by these same quite selfish countries who don't really like to give up too many of their competencies. Uh, so uh, yeah, in that, that, that problem we also see sometimes in the European Union uh, and um, I guess it's the same here. Um, I do think that, um, you know, we, we see that um, the WHO does have a lot of credibility um, and, and you see, you know, countries really, you know, moving like, yes, indeed, what the WHO says is, uh, is very important, it's, but, you know, in the end, we know everything better than WHO, so we will just do whatever we think is right. Um, and it's, uh, I guess it's also, it must be very frustrating also for the organization itself. I have to say, though, they did come out very strongly with moral leadership on this point, um, which really got me thinking. So I, I think, yeah, they, they don't have a strong legal position, but, but morally and scientifically, I think they have shown good leadership here. And somebody else is asking, um, why isn't there an international science body? And I think this raises interesting questions because we've already talked about the fact that the the scientific team in Oxford understood that this was where we were going to end up and they wanted to make it available. So why, why aren't we allowing scientists to have that power? You know, why are we allowing um, the pharmaceutical companies to have the power when they're actually making profit driven decisions rather than the scientists? Could we imagine that as a result of this pandemic, we could see health experts and scientists have more power over how we reach these decisions? Yeah. Um... I could jump in here if um, if that's yeah. Um, I think that's a really interesting question, and I think that's something that we need to um, have you know envisage for the future. Basically, you know, professors at Oxford University, including Sarah Gilbert, um, Adrian Hill, that you sometimes see 
um, on the news and talking about their their vaccine, you know, they they some of them spoke out early in the pandemic and said, you know, we we know what can happen, um, you know, related to access. We know we need to have open licensing. We don't want to have an exclusive license for our product with a pharmaceutical company because we know that that would limit access, particularly for low and middle income countries. So they, they knew all the challenges, but yet we know then what happened later was that the UK government and as well as the Gates Foundation um, got involved um, and essentially kind of pressured them into signing an exclusive license with AstraZeneca because that is the business as, the, as usual model that we have always followed. They said, you know, you need to partner with a big pharmaceutical company in order to, um, you know, scale up clinical trials, manufacturing and distribution of, of your product. But obviously we've seen now where that's got us. And so I think we need to look at open licensing and, and show you know, raise awareness of the power that universities and public institutions have. Public funding is what got us the development of COVID vaccines. You know, professors at Oxford University and the scientist team there have been working on these for years. There was then obviously an injection of public funding. The, the six front runner vaccine um, candidates for COVID have had over $10 billion of public funding, They've a huge public investment. And so it's actually, you know, public funding that has got us here. And so then why at that point would you then hand over these public investments to a private company? That is where we went wrong. So I think we have to reimagine the model from that point onwards. And instead of doing that, we need to maintain the public control of the manufacturing and distribution of these products, because that is what would maximise access for, for everyone. You know, as, as Izzy said, these should be global, global public goods. Um, particularly in a situation of a pandemic where monopolizing and limiting supply and increasing prices is really dangerous, as we're seeing now. So I think that's where we went wrong um, in, the, in the model, particularly the AstraZeneca Oxford model. Let me just check out with you then, because um, people still say, and I'm not sure, may, maybe this is still partly true, that the AstraZeneca vaccine, the um, knowledge of how to make it has been given to India, maybe Brazil, and it is being made at cost. So it's still, isn't it partly a better model than, say, the completely private Pfizer-BioNTech model? Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, so there's been some positive, I think because largely because of the position of Oxford University, there has been some positive steps that Oxford and AstraZeneca have taken. So we know that because of Oxford's position, um, they did want a, despite being pressured into having an exclusive license, they did um, want a partner that would agree to no profit pricing. And so um, AstraZeneca uh, apparently committed to that. And so um, they partnered with them. And so what we're seeing now is um, AstraZeneca going and doing their own um, sub-licensing with some manufacturers. So that includes Serum Institute of India, Brazilian manufacturer and, and a few others. However, going back to the issue of transparency, we know that basically none of these licenses are being made public. We know there are clauses in the terms of these licenses, which for, for example, we know that they committed to no profit pricing until the pandemic is declared over. And mm. one of the terms of these licenses is actually that they will declare it over July this year. And so what that means contractually is that they don't have to commit to no profit pricing beyond July this year, which is obviously very soon. And so, you know, that the, the lack of transparency of these licenses, like the devil is in the detail. We need to have transparency of these licenses. But also, despite their commitment to no profit pricing, what we're actually seeing is some huge price disparities around the world. So, you know, as you said, there was a bit of a, a leak of the EU prices. Um, that they're paying basically around three dollars a dose for the AstraZeneca vaccine but actually we know that Uganda is paying seven dollars a dose for the AstraZeneca vaccine so that doesn't sound like no profit pricing to me you know South Africa paying five dollars a dose why are we seeing different prices and particularly why are we seeing low-income countries paying substantially more than high-income countries so there's mm. many questions to be asked there and I think that this really goes back to the transparency of licensing um, deals because we really don't know what the terms are. Okay, great. I, I've spotted another question, which I think is a good one for Izzy. So I'm going to just, it was quite a nice question. So I'm going to actually read it rather than summarize it from Richard Steele. Oh no, I can't find it now. That's bound to happen, isn't it? Here we are. Richard Steele asks, Big Pharma seems to be in control. Do you think it is time to dismantle these organizations and bring, 
bring drug research, production and distribution back into the control of an organisation such as the WHO? Izzy, what do you think? I mean, that's like a big question. I mean, obviously, <laughs> going on with... They're the best ones. They're always the best ones. I think obviously what's been going on with Big Pharma isn't a new thing, though. I, mean, I know it's been much more scaled up because it's like a global pandemic, but these problems have been happening for years. It happened with HIV treatment, rich countries telling people in poorer countries that their lives couldn't be saved because it might harm pharmaceutical innovation. So I think, like, obviously, in, in an ideal world, everyone would be sharing the know-how for every drug and we'd all be saving everyone's lives. And I like that would be honestly what I would love, but I don't know how feasible that is. And I don't think don't necessarily that they'd even agree to that but yeah I mean it would it's hard when you know like I said before that there's a medication that could literally transform your life like there was a cystic fibrosis drug that we campaigned for five years for getting in the UK and there are poor countries that don't have that medicine yet and it's just awful even within like cystic fibrosis to know that I people like me can take it but then they can't so it's hard I don't know why they can't I wish they would you know, this is a Green Party setting, so you can ask for things as wild as you like. <laughs> I, I, I mean, to me, that question is about market power. And, um, you know, we agree in the UK, this is one of the really marvellous things about being here, that the NHS is established on the basis of need. It doesn't always work out, but basically that's it. So rich people, OK, some of them are flying to Abu Dhabi to get vaccinated, but basically they're queuing on the basis of need and you know, I'm going to walk, I'm 57, at some point I'll walk 400 yards down the road and I will get my vaccine there because that's how the NHS works, which I think is a marvellous thing. And it's like our national religion, people say that because we really value it that way. But why don't we extend that to drugs? Why do we say that drugs can be bought and sold within a market? I find that completely inconsistent. And, you know, things that are really important and fundamental to life, we do not allow them to be sold in a market. And for some reason, we don't put drugs in that box. And I've never really understood why not and I think it's something we should be much more vociferous about not only because use of drugs as, as you said Izzy needs to be you know drugs should be allocated based on need but also because um because it's just a, a fundamental principle that you shouldn't have massive big companies anyway and all the pharma companies are monopolies so why on earth do we allow them Anyway, sorry, I'm supposed to be moderating here and not ranting, so I apologise for that. But don't ever be afraid to ask for something as extreme as you like, Izzy. That's what we're here for. Right, OK, last question, because we're slightly running out of time and I'd like us to think about some action points before we do. So Dia Linda asks an interesting question, which is, what is the environmental footprint of the development of these vaccines? She's asking in terms of vials that will be thrown away and that kind of thing. But what I heard somebody earlier saying that the vaccine was developed using um, horseshoe crab blood or something vegans are worried about this anyway anybody know any answers to those questions no we're not experts on that never mind sorry dear linda right so um let's just move on to think a little bit then about what we can do about this we've already had the idea of the petition which i think is great i think we need to try and find the right petition and get it going globally right if we've got contacts in other countries um, if we really got behind one of those, I think we could really start to put some pressure on. But uh, what other ways can we think of to put pressure on, especially the, the, especially I think the governments in the countries where the drug companies are based? That seems to be the way to get through this, doesn't it? Anybody got any ideas? You mentioned this early day motion, Ros. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think one of the one of the critical things, like you said, also a bit earlier, Molly, is that I think there's not enough public awareness of what's happening. You know, we have we have the NHS, obviously. I mean, from a UK angle, um, and uh, you know, free at the point of access, and um, we all very much value that. You know, particularly after the coronavirus pandemic, um, but we don't see the risk that you the NHS is being put at by being charged high prices by pharmaceutical companies, basically and held to ransom. And this is not just happening in the UK, this is happening around the world. And as Izzy said, this is costing lives. So I think, um, you know, we really need to raise awareness publicly that this, this is the system that we have, and this is a system that countries are backing up, particularly rich countries continuously backing up. And so I think, um, yeah, Caroline Lucas has, has put together this early day motion. Um, and so obviously, the more MPs we can get to support that, 
the more MPs we can get to speak up about these issues that I think they are the government is start, starting to feel the heat a little bit um, on, on some of these issues. Um, there was a, a very defensive response from Matt Hancock today to a question from Caroline Lucas on this in Parliament. Um, so I think raising awareness about the issues that we have more broadly within the system and, and to take the, the conversation away from, you know, taking a dose from someone in the UK to give to someone else, but instead looking more broadly at the system of the monopolies that we're seeing and why are we seeing these limited supplies um, so that we can tackle the root of the problem so that we can basically all get access. So I think, uh, yeah, I think wherever we can get support for these issues in parliament in, in various countries is, is a great help. Any ideas from the European Union, Kim? You're having a debate tomorrow, you say? Yes, we're having a debate tomorrow. Um, this will probably be much more political in terms of, you know, slamming uh, Ursula von der Leyen for not doing everything, right? What else is new, hey? Um, yeah, but, um, you know, I think, um, you know, the call for solidarity is basically going to be at the center um, of, the, of the input that we will give as, as Greens. Um, also, the demand for um, ensuring, um, you know, that these the the the, the IP uh, waiver is is put forward uh, also towards the WHO, and I really hope that that that's uh, going to be something there. Um, you know, we also see within the European Union that there's vaccine nationalism. We see in within the European Union that you know uh, some uh, member states are you know getting extra doses again whilst we already have three times the amount that we will need <laughs> um, mm. uh, lined up for us. Um, and still, you know, uh, we, we, there are still people, um, uh, still countries trying to get even more vaccines. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, um, we, we, we have started in the European Union on a more solidary, solidaric, is that the word, Sol solidary foot? um uh, when we when because we we decided to have to join procurement we decided that you know not one country should have more vaccines than others but it's it's still very much focused um inwards and only you know fair distribution within the eu and not across the globe and i think mm -hmm. we we will have to continue fighting really hard to uh, to keep that um keep that focus especially since you know, we also see that almost every member state is struggling in general to um, to vaccinate their people. Um, actually, the, the Dutch news has been um, full of uh, uh, how do how uh, is the UK doing it because we're not managing um, <laughs> any any proper vaccinations. Um, we don't even have a strategy anymore, I think, or perhaps we do have one again because we had a strategy and then we couldn't do it and then we got another vaccine and then something was delayed and in the end nobody knew who had to get a vaccine first um so um yeah i think that's the situation also in many member states and then having you know to look beyond your borders to the european union and then even further to other countries is is really difficult when you're not able to you know <laughs> fix things on your own mm, mm. yeah i get that sense of it you know your morality sort of um, is diluted, isn't it? As you know, the distance increases, which is a very strange thing. It shouldn't be that way. Did you have a few um, concluding thoughts, Izzy? Because we're getting towards seven o'clock now. Yeah, essentially, like with just treatment, we're just asking, like the governments and putting pressure on MPs to pressure the Prime Minister, like to you know back trips waiver, join C CTAP, and if they don't, then. The governments really should be using their legal tools at their disposal to break monopolies so like compulsory licensing to break patents and enforcing the sharing of know-how and yeah that we've got a few petitions and like letters that people can send to their mps as well that are on like our website so yeah yeah good we'll try and share some of those through our networks definitely after after the meeting thank you thank you all very much I noticed um, in the chat, Emily said something I agree with, so I'm just going to say that, use chair's prerogative, which is once we get to everybody that's vulnerable vaccinated in the UK, we should donate one actual supply of vaccine for everyone we use here. That seems to me a very simple and straightforward thing. Emily suggests that. I think it's, yeah, anyway, somebody can tell me later if that's not practical. Right, so it's nearly seven o'clock. We're going to have to wind down now. Thank you so much to you 
lovely panelists for taking the time to share your ideas and all your knowledge and your campaigning experience. It's been great. For people in the audience, we're going to put a link in the chat, I think, in the chat about the next event, which is going to be hosted by the Green Party, and that's going to take place next week. Well, there we are, I can see it's popped in, and it's on Sean Berry's mayoral campaign. So if you would like to RSVP, then Green Party staff will um, share that link now. If you're interested in watching replays of any of our previous events, we have a selection hosted on our Green Living Room, and we'll send you a link after the event as well to a replay of this evening's discussion. And uh, if you'd like to share that with friends, please do. Please get more people thinking about the need to share this important knowledge that after all we've paid for and that can save lives. Also, if you're not already a Green Party member, we have our conference coming up in the spring. It says in the spring, it's in two weekends time actually. So if you're interested in contributing to the Green Party's policy creation, you can sign up. Hopefully somebody's going to put the link again in the chat. So that's all I've got to say on my important notes of important information. But I'd just like to, to finally say thanks again to you three participants. It's a great discussion. I, I learned a lot. And uh, yeah, you know, the, we've got a long way to go, but we can definitely campaign on this and maybe use the COVID pandemic to get some important changes in terms of who's really got power over drugs. So thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.